Today we're playing through Pokemon Castaway. Imagine you're going on a vacation in the Pokemon universe, but you're not going by your favorite bird Pokemon. You're actually going by plane. But in the middle of your flight, the plane malfunctions and you're forced to jump out with a parachute and where you'll be landing is still a mystery. And well, today we're going to see how an event like that will play out and if we have what it takes to survive the crash. So let's get right into the story of Pokemon Castaway. We start off by opening our computer and checking our mail, and we see something very interesting. An email that says, Congratulations, you have been selected as one of the winners of our Serenity Draw. As stated upon the entry ballot, your prize contains an all-expenses-included trip to the Alola region, and our flight is set to leave within the next seven days. So I immediately start packing, and upon the day that my plane leaves, I head to the airport. The police officer at the airport asks me for all of my information, Information, namely my name and whether I'm a boy or a girl. But also a weird little thing, my blood type, which I personally don't even know, so I just picked a B plus. I also have my partner Pokemon Barboach traveling with me, so we have to register him as well. And once that's all done, we can board the plane and wait for our flight to start. We start to think by ourselves that this is really something we deserve, some time of our job in a place where we can totally chill out. And on top of this, I've basically been entering sweepstakes and lotteries for so many years and never won anything. So this was definitely a nudge in the right direction. As we're up in the air, you can do three things to try and pass the time. Play a game of Voltorb Flip, which we absolutely sucked at. We can watch a commercial on the tiny built-in TV that displays me actually winning this prize by saying the phrase Butterfree Juice. My neighbor then recognizes me from said commercial and we start talking. He says that he's always wary of planes when he goes traveling because of the takeoff off period and he even offers me some gum so that I can relieve the pressure that is going to be pressing on my ears. We accept and he says that it's orange and mint, his favorite flavor. I'm more of a strawberry guy myself but I'll take it. After takeoff we start to doze off and fall asleep but then over the speakers we hear that there is some unexpected turbulence and lightning all of a sudden strikes the plane. Everybody's already left by the time I wake up and the plane's actually on fire and crashing down. So I run to the back, grab one of the last parachutes and jump out. A couple of days later, I wake up on the Bermada beach with Barboche protecting me near the fire I made. This fire is the only way that we can heal up our Pokemon and rest up ourselves. And it also works as a PC box. So to us, this feels like the most important thing ever. But you know what game I would love to play if I was stuck on a playing for 15 hours, the sponsor of today's video, Dimensionals. A turn-based RPG roguelike that also lets you build your own deck and combines a ton of features of different games. For example, the combat feels sort of like double battles in Pokemon, and it also reminds me of a game that I absolutely love, Slay the Spire. You and the Dimensionals, which are like the Avengers of this universe, need to protect it from your enemies, the Spectres. And you do this by building your own lineup of Dimensionals you find on your travels, by adding ability cards to them, which all have their very own effects, like blocking, attacking, and even dealing piercing damage. I would say the battle system is pretty deep because you can upgrade your attack, you can use stuff like potions to deal damage to your enemies or buff your own stats and so much more. The visuals in this game are also breathtaking. I absolutely love the cartoonish comic book style and some story elements get explained with these animated cutscenes that are beautiful to look at. I also like most of the character designs that they've come up with and if I had to choose my personal favorite design would be Shade Strike. Unfortunately the game isn't fully out yet but there is a demo available to play in which you can go over the prologue of the story, but there is also a master raid mode that allows you to go deeper into the combat system itself. If all of this sounds interesting to you, Dimensionals is now available to wishlist on Steam via the link in the pinned comment or description down below. Their full game is set to release on November 18th of this month, and I highly recommend that you check it out. Again, a huge thank you to Dimensionals for sponsoring today's video, and let's get right
right back into Pokemon Castaway. We're surprised that we made it out alive and are about to explore the island, but first I pick up my starting items, some Pokeballs, potions, and repels. And after putting them in my suitcase because we don't have a regular bag with us, we start to look around and quickly see that it's filled with wild Pokemon. The first one I run into is a Krabby, which I end up capturing and adding to the team. There's a nearby forest, but before we go in, a voice in my head says that I should go and look in the water to see if I can find the wreckage of the plane crash, and if so, if there is any more people alive. This is where I found out that this game has actual logic. You don't need a surf Pokemon to go swimming. No, my character can just do it himself. But he also seems to be an Olympic swimmer, because we have to dive down to the ocean floor where he can stay forever. He doesn't need any equipment, which might mean he's part fish or has gills or something. He might also be the legendary hero Aquaman. Who knows? All I know is that down here I managed to capture myself another team member in Carvana, and after some thorough searching, we eventually find the plane wreckage. Inside, we find items that the other passengers left behind, so we pick them up for ourselves. The plane is also filled with dangerous Pokemon like Carvana and Inkay that attack me out of nowhere, which means I need to be on my toes at all time, which is hard to do underwater. Inside of one of the cages, a Pokemon was still stuck, so I decided to free it, which added Magikarp to my squad as well. When he eventually evolves into Gyarados, I'll definitely have something to protect me from anything dangerous that comes in my path. I then head to the cockpit where I realize that nobody is still on this plane, not even bodies can be found, which means everybody must have made it out alive, so hopefully we'll run into them later on the island. I am able to pick up some very important items, namely the XP share and leftovers here though. We get back to land and as we try to enter the nearby forest, we get stopped by, to my shocking surprise, another human. He says that he's seen me on TV and that I'm the Butterfree Juice Man, which is already weird because we thought this island was uninhabited. Like, why would they even have TV here? He then explains that he was about to investigate the plane crash and that we're the only person around. He also mentions that he's a researcher on this island and that he has a boat somewhere, but it floated away. So he also came here to see if it drifted to these parts. Since we're in a state of shock, we have I've actually still not said anything to him, so he tries to snap me out of it with a Pokemon battle. He throws out his Drowsy, which is an easy kill, for my Barbortus water pulses as it's pouring down with rain. He sees that that didn't really accomplish anything and invites me to his lab, which is just past the forest. After he leaves, we follow in his footsteps and see that this forest is more like a jungle, with waterfalls, high trees, and Pokemon ready to ambush you anywhere. I mean, I was getting attacked by Spinarags that just jumped out of trees, venipedes that came up to me from underground, and these kind of worked like trainer battles, cause you couldn't run away from them, you had to defeat them in order to get past it. But I've heard that when you become hunted, you really want to start hunting yourself. And this is what I tried to do with this farfetch, but it always got away from me, bonking its stick on my head, flying over me, and kind of being a pain in the butt, so I just left it alone after some time. I did end up capturing a Skrelp and Slackoth in the forest before I finally found my way to the campfire, which I rested at for a little bit before trying to exit the forest. But I get stopped yet again by a wannabe superhero that jumps out of a tree. He thinks that we're after the treasure that he's after as well, and he says that he's the only one that's going to be able to get it, and that our journey is going to end here by the hand of El Dorado. He only had two Pokemon, a Meowth and a Curlia, which both got destroyed by Barbortus Water Pulse and Magnitude, but I do think that Meowth is a very cool Pokemon. Pokemon to see here because he's kind of like a thief and Meowth looks like a Pokemon that loves stealing. Definitely if you go off of the Meowth that Team Rocket has. Upon defeat, he fades away into the forest and whispers, Don't think this is the end as we'll probably see him again in the future, but we can finally move on from the forest and the next area kind of surprised me, as it seems we've landed in a dried up desert slash canyon area with Pokemon like Graveler and Numel roaming around the place. You have to complete dozens of parkours by skipping over rocks and these Pokemon will stop you in your tracks, which is a dangerous landscape if you think about it, which is emphasized even more by all of the dead skeletons lying around. I have a feeling that if you stay here for too long, you definitely 
definitely won't survive. But our odds go up significantly as our Slackoth evolves into Vigoroth and we find a side path that leads to the lab of the scientists that we saw before. But when we knock on the door, it seems like nobody's home. So I'm thinking by myself, he's probably out on a field trip looking for something or researching something. So we go back to the desert and find another way out. But when you enter this pathway, a fog that is incredibly deep fills the area. And considering we can't see anything and don't want to get lost, we go back immediately. And to my surprise, the scientist is actually following in my footsteps and says that we shouldn't bother going into the forest right now, as a strange mist has settled over the area. However, he has been working on a machine that mimics the ability defog that Pokemon can have to try and clear up the area. But he still needs to do a little bit of testing for it and asks me to come to his lab. So we enter into his comfy home that has cages, computers, Pokemon in habitats, and even the TV that he saw my commercial on. So we want to watch it ourselves, but when we talk to it, a Rodon pops out of it for a battle. I tried to capture it and add it to my team, but it didn't work out because Skrelp accidentally poisoned it with Poison Touch, which killed it in the end. After sleeping in his bed, we talk to Argon to see if he's made any progress yet. He says that he needs to see a Pokemon use Defog in battle, so that he has more of an idea of how it works. So he asks me if we want to be his lab rat. I comply and immediately see that I'm getting my ass whipped. He has three Pokemon, a Pelipper, a Mantine, and the Drowsy from before that has now evolved into Hypno. The Pelipper just spams Surf, which kills my entire team because they're not up to snuff with their levels. So after getting my ass whooped, I go back to the wilds and evolve some of my Pokemon, mainly Magikarp into Gyarados and Barboach into Wishcash. I also head back to the forest to capture a Jolting because electric types are going to be good against those water flying beasts that we're facing. I then head back to the lab and battle him again. This time I'm able to get an Electro Web off, which already does amazing damage before Jolty gets taken out. And because of Pelipper's Drizzle, my Wishcash's Aqua Tails are actually doing decent damage as well. After bringing both of them under 50% health, I'm able to bring in Skrelp and Vigoroth, who after a Hyper Potion on Mantine, are able to bring him back down into red health yet again. I send out Carvana, because Vigoroth has bitten to dust, and with an Ice Fang and Aqua Jet, these two get finished off by Carvana. Hypno then gets downed by an assurance and this ends off the battle with Argon. He now sees what he did wrong and adjusts the machines to what he has learned. But he's going to need some time before that finishes, so we should rest up in his bed while he works on it as we must be exhausted for surviving all this time. So we lay down in the comfy bed and start dozing off. But while we're sleeping, we suddenly hear that he's on a phone call talking about the plane crash, about how we're the only survivor and that he should be doing something about the situation but doesn't really know what. Just before hanging up, we hear him say, All right, all right, I'll be there. So this is definitely mysterious, because when we make up, he acts all normal and like nothing even happened. As he tells me that I look revitalized and that we should go and meet him at the swamp's entrance. He uses the defogger and boom, the area clears up. And we see that we're not in the swamp yet, because it lies beyond what we're in here, the village. That's right, this island has a fully functional village with people that seem to have never had contact with anything from the outside world. I mean, there's a fully functional inn where nobody ever stays at because they never have outside visitors, various shops, a special tower that we can't enter yet, and even a church. Eventually, we make it to the other side of town where we are supposed to enter the swamp, but as we try to do that, we get ambushed by four villagers. They think that I'm the one who's been causing trouble around here. What they mean with trouble, I don't know yet, but they straight up go into attacking me. Because there's four of them and my team really isn't looking all that great at the moment, I actually ended up losing to these guys yet again. I thought I would get captured, but I managed to scurry away, which gave me an opportunity to train up the rest of my team again. Once I was done, I was able to take out the first guys, Halucha, Medicham, and Skrelp without much trouble, and going into the second battle, we managed to get rid of yet another Medicham and the Throw and Sog brothers. After our battle, the village elder shows up and asks us what all 
all of this ruckus is. The villagers immediately start accusing me without any evidence and the elder sees that I'm actually a good guy because he can see that the aura between me and my Pokemon is good and that I don't radiate any evil signs like the ones that have been plaguing them. They apologize and give me some Moo Moo Milks for my trouble and then I'll run away. The elder stays around though and tells the story about how people that go through the swamp to the temple have gone missing lately and he doesn't want us to suffer the same faith. So in order to show him that we're a strong trainer, he tells me that we should go to the top of Miss Tower to try and pick up their beloved artifact. If we manage to do that, while defeating all of his disciples along the way, he'll allow me to pass. So we head straight over there and beat up a couple of disciples first. This in return grants me access to the tower, but I immediately notice that everybody I have faced so far except for the scientist is using fighting type Pokemon. And my suspicions got validated even more when I entered the tower, because not only were the wild Pokemon here mostly fighting, no, all the trainers that I had to face in here also had fully functioning fighting type teams. This wasn't the only obstacle though as the building was filled with cracks and holes that I had to jump over as a sort of puzzle parkour. But you can call me Michael Scott because I aced all of that and got myself to the top. But just as I take the precious item from the pedestal, I get interrupted by El Dorado, who's behind it too. As he says, treasure stealing is my job on guard. And so we lash out in yet another Pokemon battle. My wish cache starts off by taking out the first Pokemon Bisharp with Earthquake. I also hit one on the next one Gallade, thinking that it wasn't going to be able to touch me. But then it busted out its signature move, Leaf Blade, which actually took out my wish cache in one hit. Or should I say Slice? Luckily, Sharpedo can finish it off with Priority Aqua Jet, and the next Pokemon Krogunk goes down the same way. Persian then uses Fake Out to plop my Sharpedo back into the sea, but because of Rough Skin, it does take a little bit of damage. My Vigoroth then uses Slash two more times to finish off Persian, but even with that defeat, Eldorado doesn't want to give up and tells me to hand over the treasure. We refuse and he cuts it out of my hand, but as he inspects it, he realizes that it's not gold or anything valuable, it's just a plain old temple key. So he tells me to keep it because he's only after real treasure. He then disappears and we can head to the swamp, where our final challenge awaits us. You see, this elder here isn't satisfied by me just picking up the key. He needs to see with his own eyes that I have what it takes to conquer the path to the temple. He of course has a top tier fighting type team with passion. Angoro that parting shots out into Medicham, who thunder punches my Gyarados, which totally obliterated my sea snake. I then went on to spam Earthquake and Aqua Tail, which shook his entire team to its score. None of them could stand up to my water ground fish, as Medicham, Pangoro, Gabite, Dragonair, and Beware all fell in front of my fins. After the battle, he finally realizes that we are indeed going to make it through, but he tells me to not swim in this water because it's super murky. That's when he calls an old friend of his named Lotad. He tells me to climb upon the little creature and then it will bring me to my destination. As we arrive at the hidden temple, we first rest up at the shrine and then start investigating. It's a very big place with a lot of statues and long hallways, but mainly tons of puzzles just like in the tower that we just managed to complete. As you run through the puzzles, some statues will come to life and then you'll have to fight the wild Pokemon that comes out of it. These are mostly Dratinis and Gibble. At the end of your puzzle, you'll have to face a stone soldier, and once these are defeated, a new puzzle will open up. This way, I had to do two invisible tile puzzles that you had to remember the pattern of, and after defeating their stone soldiers, there was one more rock-skipping puzzle, and the fourth soldier was actually the last one. All of their teams consisted mostly of Dragon-type Pokemon, which was pretty cool to see, definitely this cool Tyrantrum sprite. I then went to the main room that has just opened up, and I decided to put my temple key in the middle of the pedestal. But then everything suddenly goes black before my eyes and I wake up in a cell with a loudspeaker telling me that I certainly caused them a lot of trouble. They tell me that I better stay put because the consequences of trying to escape are very bad. So I tell them that I'll stay put and then a couple of minutes go by as my knight in shining armor appears. It's Eldorado and he's here to save me. He breaks the jail cell with the help of his crow and tells me that he's going to guard the harbor because that's just upstairs and I need to see if I can find some treasure laying around. The only reason he saved me is because he has a conscience, not like the people that are locking me up here, which we still
still don't know anything about, by the way. So we head outside of our cell and start exploring, and we quickly realize that there's cameras everywhere. Not only that, the rest of the cells are filled with other people and creatures. Like somebody that's been fused with a parasite on its face, an egg with eyes, a half machine, half man, and even the weird Ditto Mew fusion. This already gives me a very creepy vibe, as I start to think by myself that all of these creatures and people have been experimented on. We enter the next room and immediately get recognized by a scientist as an escaped prisoner. But I try to play it off by saying that I'm the new hire. He seems to believe me and walks off, but then comes sprinting back and says, But why are you wearing normal clothes? You are an escaped prisoner. To which we answer, No, it's casual Friday. He then believes me yet again and says, Oh. Right, I forgot about that. You must be the only one that got the memo. Everybody else is in their uniform. You're free to go. This is where we kind of get free reign of exploring this entire place. There are cameras everywhere, as I just said, but there is also these spotlights all over the place, and if you walk into them, one of the security guards will come and challenge you. So I was being extra careful to try and avoid as much of these as possible. But there is also the reception desk, where we can get some more information. He says that there's four rooms here, the labs, the storage, kitchen and communal area. All of these have gearboxes that we have to mess with in order to get into the boss's room. We first go through the labs where we have to do another tile puzzle and once you get through that, you'll be seeing some more weird experiments like a master ball electrode and an old man that's infected with some sort of virus or he might have just puked on himself. I don't know. Once you get through all of the enforcers that try to stop you, you can mess with the cables. With one of the four done, I went back to my beds to rest up a little bit, to which we see that El Dorado has actually saved other people around here. So the more gearboxes you manage to successfully defect, the more people he's going to be able to save. After this, we head to the communal area where we see some blatant product placement, and after checking out some of the living quarters and seeing some horrible sights, we eventually make it through the storage without any problems and disconnect the wires there too. Inside another guy's living quarter, I managed to undo more wires, but we also get stopped by an enforcer that says that we were supposed to be experimented on and that our blood type AB plus was going to be perfect for it. We're not going to let them do that as we head to the kitchen straight after and connect to wires there too. And with that last box being done, we evolve our Vigoroth into slacking, giving us the opportunity to walk through that last door and see who the boss really is. But first, we see our good old friend Argon, who's a scientist here. He works for Serenity Incorporated, which is the company we actually won the Alolan trip from, and he explains that they've been running this scam of sending people on a vacation for many years now. So almost everything that happened up until this point has been set up. Because this is the Bermuda Triangle, a lot of planes crash here naturally, and they decided to take advantage of this by setting up a lab to research and run tests on the victims of these plane crashes, as nobody ever comes here anyway, and nobody really expects plane crash survivors to be habited here. He says that all of this is supposed to be for the good of the world, but we know it's just about money. And we can try to stop them by going beyond Argon, but he's not going to let us do that so easily. And that's when our Pokeballs cross paths once again. We start off with Gyarados against his Garbodor. I am able to hit a couple of Aqua Tails, but because he was spamming hyper potions, Sludge Bombs managed to get the better of me. Joltik takes it out and hits another signal beam on the incoming Hypno, while Sharpedo can easily eat it up, just like the next Pokemon Linoon, Mantine, and even Sandygast, if it wasn't for its nasty Giga Drain after surviving my crunch. I then spam Earthquake with Wish Cash to take the little Sand Castle out and Aqua Tail his final Pokemon Pelipper to scrape out a win. This was not anticipated in their plans. Argon now says that we must face his boss's wrath in the next room, and that he wouldn't wish that upon his worst enemy. He runs out in fear, and we step up to the room that's going to answer all of our questions. Who's been the mastermind behind all of this, and why did they choose me of all people? And why are they even doing it in this way? We're about to find out with the longest elevator ride you've ever seen. As we arrive and walk up to the big desk, we hear a voice saying, Now now, don't be shy. Come along. Would you like a stick? 
of gum. And that's when we realize it's the guy from the plane. We of course say no to the gum he offered us last time because there must have been some kind of chemical in that that made us fall asleep. He doesn't say much, only that we should get down to business. And that's when our Pokemon battle starts. We start off on the upper hand with an Aqua Tail against his Rhyperior, our Gyarados takes it down. He then brings in a big Leviathan of his own. So I throw nearly everything in my arsenal at it, namely my Joltik, Skrelp, and even Slacking. But that wasn't enough. However, I was able to get a Yawn off which put it to sleep so that Sharpedo could finish it off with one last crunch. Machamp comes in and punches my Sea Snake right in the face, taking it down, but my Wish Cash can counter back with some Earthquakes. The incoming Armaldo and Malamar both get destroyed by Aqua Tails, and his last Pokemon, Hitmonlee, followed shortly after. And so we defeated Big Mastermind Bruce. After he loses, he starts muttering to himself, Calm down, Bruce. Don't do anything rash, and even asks me if I wouldn't like a stick of gum again, as this is my last chance. We once again decline, and that's when he says, Well, since you've ruined everything, I'm going to blow up this island now. He then just runs off, and we have one minute to get out of here. So we run to the docks as fast as possible and meet up with El Dorado there. He says that he was getting worried, but that all of the other escapists are aboard. And so we sail out with everybody that we saved. Even the village people are are no longer required to live there anymore, and they even came with us. El Dorado then comes up to me at the deck of the ship as he wants to know where he needs to drop us off, to which we answer, the Alola region. Because now we truly deserve this vacation. This is perfect for him because he can definitely find a market for all of the treasures he has found there, but the most valuable thing he stole from that lab were some electronics and special batteries from a plane. This is where our camera cuts back to a shot with Bruce sitting in a cockpit of a plane as it's crashing because of the missing batteries, giving him a taste of his own medicine while I can finally enjoy life. And what have we learned from this beautiful, weird little trip? Never take any gum from strangers.